Hello. Welcome to Contact. My name is Nina Rhodes, and today we're truly privileged to have as our guest Helen Shaver, who is a renowned, outstanding actress and director. Welcome, Helen. It's so good to have you on Contact. Thanks, Nina. I'm glad to be here. You've had such an incredible career, and rather than me uh, say, what have you done, because I'm sure the audience knows a lot of what you've done, mm -hmm. I'd love for you to start at a time in your life when you feel is, is, is rather inspirational to talk about. Boy, there's been so many, <laughs> so many occasions. How about a rainbow? <laughs> here, here we go. Well, I grew up, I'm the fifth of six daughters. I grew up in a small town in Ontario called St. Thomas and uh, didn't think I was going to be an actress, never thought about that. Um, when I was a little girl, I had rheumatic fever, which I, uh, kept me in the hospital for six months at a time from the time I was five till I was 12. And a lot of people, oh, that's really terrible. But for me, it was a, uh, it was a, a huge blessing because it uh, was a time when when you're a little kid and you can't use your body and you have to lay still and you're young enough to know that you're not you're not your body that you're not stuck inside your body uh, my imagination was really um, cultivated and uh, you know I got to travel all over the place um, you know by the time I was 9, 10, 11 years old I'd found out that uh, talking about that was reasonably inappropriate <laughs> people considered it lying because you had no evidence of where you'd been. Um, Did you have out-of-body experiences? Well, yeah, sure, I guess. I mean, I guess that's what they were. Uh, I, I mean, I remember when I was in grade four, I'd been in the hospital, you know, I'd been there for a few months and I came back to school and my teacher was, I pretty dysfunctional woman, I guess, because she knew where I'd been. <laughs> but there was a, a, a girl named Judy Curra, who was the most popular girl in the class, and she asked me at recess where I'd been, so I told her. I told her about this wonderful adventure I'd had when, you know, and it had, it was a fabulous landscape, you know, populated by little shiny creatures, and there were queens and kings, and I mean, it was a wonderful Camelot sort of place that I told her about, and so I guess she must have told my teacher, and toward the, the end of the afternoon, the teacher said, uh, Helen, I understand you've been on quite an adventure. Would you like to tell the whole class about it? And so I got up in front of the class, and I started to tell my story. And she let me get a few sentences into it. Uh, my classmates were sitting in rapt attention. And, uh, and then she said, Helen, you're lying. <gasps> oh. You've been in the hospital, and that's a sin to lie. And I. I wanted to die. I wanted the floor to open up and to be swallowed in and so on. And Anyway, so I went undercover with my imagination and kept those stories to myself. And uh, when I was 16 and I changed schools and in this new school there was a, there was a stage and I had every intention of being a lawyer uh, at that point. Uh, a lawyer or a poet, I wasn't quite sure. <laughs> as a 16-year-old, you know, I was also very cool. But anyway, this, uh, <laughs> this my homeroom teacher started a drama club, and my best friend and I, Ursula Zaboltz, and I decided to join this drama club. Now, neither of us had any intention of acting, but we thought it was cooler and hipper than being trying out to be for the cheerleading squad or something. And um, so we joined this drama club and the first play that he was going to direct was a play called Not Enough Rope by Elaine May and he asked me to audition and I declined because reading out loud in front of people was very uncomfortable for me and then he asked me again and I declined and then he kept me after school one day and he said just read this and it's a, it's a great piece about a very distressed young woman very black comedy and a lot of monologues in it very difficult piece, really. I've met him, Elaine May years later. She's fabulous. She's a fabulous she's woman. Just when a she, fabulous lady. When she found out I had done this play at at sixteen, she was she was oh, you did. But anyway, I so he had me read these three pages, and I sort of stumbled through it. And he said, "Okay, read it again." And I read it, and the words kind of fit together. And he said, "Okay, now read it again." And the third time I read it, uh, something magical happened, where uh, instead of the words just going in my eyes and out my mouth. Um, the words stimulated feelings and thoughts that connected each other and suddenly I, the words were mine and I was speaking them and um, truths about me, really specific truths and feelings about myself and my, how I perceived the world and uh, what was loneliness to me uh, came out through the mouthpiece of this character and I was acting. And uh, and it was incredible. 
And so that was my first experience. And this little play went into a high school competition, and I won awards, which eventually led me to the Banff School of Fine Arts that summer. The summer I was 17, and I got on the train, and I went to the mountains, which I'd never seen, and I practiced yoga on the grass in the morning overlooking the Bow River, and I saw artists and artisans of all types, and I was, I was in this community, uh, this creative community, and from the first time I walked on stage, I knew that those things that I had had to hide in the rest of the world where, the, where it was inappropriate, where it was considered lies or exaggeration or, or odd behavior, were completely appropriate in the world of the theater. Not only and appropriate, but necessary. Absolutely. <laughs> and so I began to blossom. And, and for me, it was a very uh, interesting, you know, by the next summer, I, I went back to my little hometown at the end of the summer, and, and serendipitously, uh, the local amateur theater was having a renaissance of sorts, and, and they were beginning these productions. I never even knew it existed, but there it was, and my mother said, oh, they're having an audition, and I auditioned, and got the ingenue need, lead in The Tender Trap, and then they did Guest in the House, and I was the ingenue lead, and nearby is a city called London, Ontario, that had a wonderful amateur theater, which is now a professional theater, and the artistic director saw me, and he asked me to do um, the ingenue lead in Brendan Behan's The Hostage, and, and then someone saw me in that, and the first professional theater was starting that summer in London, a repertoire theater at, at the university, at the Talbot Center at the University of Western Ontario, and I was asked to audition for that, and I, so by the time I was 18, I was, I had the role of Hilda in The Master Builder, as well as the chorus leader in The Bacchae, and I was building sets, be, you know, because it was a rep theater, and I was being paid, and I was, <laughs> I was, you know. That's a great, great thing to be yeah. paid for what you love. Oh, yes, to I do. couldn't believe it. And know? also, f from listening to you, you've had the, the great, not only the talent to do it, but the great good fortune of, of being able to speak the words of such great authors. Oh, yes, uh, I have. I mean, uh, in the theater, um, I, I got to play, play Ibsen again in my mid 20s. I played Nora in the Doll's House. And I've done, I've done a lot of wonderful theater. A, a remarkable piece of theater that I did in Los Angeles, oh gosh, about 12 years ago maybe, 13 years ago, uh, a, a play called Tamara. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I opened that there, which is written by a Canadian author, which is a really unique piece of theater. And then the last one I did was uh, opposite Alan Alda on Broadway, a Neil Simon play called Jake's Women. So, uh, you know, so that aspect of, of, of my experience has been really full. And it is, you know, my first love. There is, uh, you walk a kind of tight rope wire when you, when you take that leap onto the stage, when, when you face the fear of standing in the wings and you hear the audience and the lights go down and they say, okay, <laughs> and, and you go. There are no retakes. And, 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 but it's, it is the actor's media, you know. Uh, you, you, it is your, your play. You, you rise or fall on your own good graces at that moment and it, it's a blood sport it's fantastic <laughs> um, that's a great description <laughs> <laughs> you know, oh yeah is it i mean because there's nothing like i remember one night i was playing with alan and and the, in the middle of this very passionate very witty because it was neil simon's writing but a very heated moment and i had um heels on and these four steps to come down and he's sitting or standing by the couch at the bottom of these stairs and we're and as I came, took the second step, my heel caught on the edge of the, on the, of the stairs, and I began to topple. And in the midst of this argument, you know, I was toppling slow motion, and Alan caught it, because we played very well together, and he caught me, and I got my footing at the bottom of the stairs, and we continued the scene. And But you feel the audience just, <gasps> because now it's real, now it's happening, and now you've broken through the fourth wall, and, and there is, a blood sport <laughs> and tragedy could come any time you know it's 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 wonderful but i i've been i don't know it's all been easy is the wrong word but in terms of the progression of my career it's all been simple you know i mean it's sort of like do you ever think about if at any given point in your life you were si were to sit down and write what you think I mean, with your greatest imagination, what you think the rest of your life could be in any area, motherhood, career, whatever. Uh, and then, then you go on 10, 20 years and you look back at what you would have projected for yourself and it's a little tiny pamphlet compared to the volumes that life presents you with, you know? And uh, for me, 
so far, you know, and I'm, I figure I'm about midway through my career now, um, or at least my life. <laughs> uh, I, you have a library. <laughs> it is incredible. <laughs> it is incredible what's happened to me. You know, um, well, it's, it's incredible. Also, I do believe that in some ways you manifest that for yourself. There's this, a confidence that you exude, um, a, a creativity that you were born with. And I do believe when, you, when you're focused and, and you're on path, that mm. you do manifest what happens in your life. Yeah. And you really, really know that you, you can do this and you walk into this with this, this aura of light around you. It, it's very attractive for people to ask you to audition rather than you <laughs> standing there and say, oh, God, I really need this job. You oh, know? They, those are the worst days, aren't they? <laughs> I've been there. But no, I, yeah, I think that uh, in terms of my own beliefs about things, uh, it seems to me that the universe is a very ecologically sound place from a grain of brown rice that if we don't mess with it completely, it uses itself up. It, it's all useful. It's all perfect. And, you know, I've long known that if the sun rises every day and the tides go in and the tides go out and chickens lay eggs, it's a, a wildly egotistical for me to think that I'm anything except perfect, perfectly Helen. And I am each day perfectly Helen. And that if I stay out of my own way, that all of the aspects of myself, my creativity, my intelligence, my sexuality, my humor, my p compassion, my all of it will be used because it is just like the little grain of brown rice, perfectly formed. So your perception is in order with your life? Yeah, as long as I stay out of the way. I mean, now, of course, I'm a human being, and we don't, you know, what, it was, what is it? We claim spiritual progression, not spiritual perfection, you know? Spiritual progress rather than spiritual perfection. But um, I, I think that the ego, which is a really useful tool, uh, is, is fabulous except when it's in the driver's seat because it's so often itself driven by fears. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's where the ecology of, of beingness gets thrown out of whack. But as long as I stay out of my own way um, and take care of myself and take care of those around me, and, and then it's all going to be fine. You now know? Fear is a, is, peop is a person's worst enemy. It's a roadblock uh, that, that just keeps you from, from your path. And uh, I, I, I f chatting with you and, and, and being with you for the short time that we are, I do see that fear is not a part of your life, which is a, a great part of a lot of actors' life. And the lack of fear has now taken you to a great adventure and directorial chores, which I'd love for you to oh, talk I'd about. Oh, I'd like to talk about that. I, one, one last word about fear. Someone once told me, a wise woman once told me, that fear is an anagram for false evidence appearing real, which I, I, I thought was pretty wonderful. And I remember that when I'm scared. Because mm -hmm. being scared is all right. You're supposed to be scared. I mean, it's like the Wizard of Oz, right? It, the lion asks for courage, and he gets hard things to do. Um, I mean, when, when none of us not supposed to be scared, but it's when you're driven by fear, when you, when you try to manipulate, and at least for myself, it, I, I, I always sell myself short in those cases. But um, <laughs> and believe me, when I started directing, I was scared, but I was supposed to be. <laughs> well, that's a healthy fear. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's, it, more than fear, I think it's a healthy awareness of what you're about to undertake. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and some anxiety that might come with it. <laughs> that's right. And, and I've certainly been around great directors and not so great directors, so I had lots of examples. <laughs> well, you worked with Spielberg, which is, I think, an actor's dream. It has to be, uh, you know, yeah, Spielberg a Spielberg experience. And, and my, I have to say, though, my favorite, 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 favorite is Scorsese. He has such, he is such a genius. I mean, uh, Spielberg is also a genius, but for me, uh, Scorsese just has such, um, he directs with yes. He has a bottom line that exists. He has a, a vision that he's secure in. And he's incredibly respectful of every aspect. And he, he, he accepts the fact that he doesn't understand women, for example. You know, I, I, he, but he's fascinated by them, you know? Um, he, he's, he's really, oh, he's a trip. But um, anyway. how, how is that enhanced, these experience with these directors as an actress, how, how has that contributed to your directorial talents? Well, I think, I mean, the, the, the experience is, is, uh, is everything. It's given me the confidence to, to say I can direct. It's given me um, an education about how, for, as an actress, I, 
and, and, and watching the crew also, I know that what stimulates my greatest creativity is an environment where it's okay to make a mistake. Uh, um, th there are so many things. And so when I was offered this series that I'm doing now, right now, Poltergeist, uh, that we're shooting here in Vancouver, I wasn't really terribly interested in doing a series, but um, I talked to Richard Lewis, the creator, and I said, you know what? I could do this series. I could get into doing this series, but right now I also want to direct. So if you if you balance the offer with the opportunity to direct, then I'll I'll do it. And and um, and that's how I got here. So I, what I found in directing, as well as being able, because I've always had a, a very visual sense. I I, I appreciate the frame, uh, um, the moving picture. I I think that you know it's been said many times better than I could possibly say it, but a, a picture's worth a thousand words. That you can evoke uh, on a subconscious level, on a subliminal level, so much more with a visual image than words could ever do. Um, now, if you then embellish it with words, you, you, you surround it in sound. I mean, now, now you have a full experience. But uh, it, it's, it's been really, really fascinating for me to be able to work with the visual and to compose the frame and tell the story because so often we're telling a story within a story I, I, I let me go back a little bit um, I, I quit acting when I was 19 I, I thought part of part of it was fear but part of it was that I thought oh well the world does not need another actress I mean what are actors anyway because it had all come so easily to me that I didn't really have a respect for acting I didn't have a respect for the theater or, or the film or the storytelling that we do. And I, and I quit and I went into nursing and I worked with emotionally disturbed kids and did this for a couple years until my 21st birthday when I stopped all that and got a job acting again because I realized I was committing suicide in a socially acceptable form. But um, that I, and, and, and I began to know then that I, and accept the fact that I am an actress, that I am a storyteller. And once I'd come to that, I began to realize that this thread of storyteller is an important thread in the tapestry of humanity that we can there's no possibility of any human being making change unless they identify where they are and accept where they are uh, that acceptance is the first step of that and that from cave time uh, with the guy around the fire a fire drawing pictures on the wall and telling us a, a story of hunting the big beast that scared him and yet he he went out and got it or finding the maiden and drawing her in and making a child or 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 seeking god or on the outside or on the inside or whatever the stories they were that they told then i'm sure they're much the same as what we tell now and that the that whether we're tel telling it in the form of a comedy or a mystery or a uh, melodrama or a big action film that all of that is simply there to occupy the 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 conscious part of the mind to give give that little analytical part of our brain something to do because when it has something to do we are disarmed when we laugh when we cry when we, when we jump with fear at a moment in in a suspenseful story we are disarmed and at that moment the inner self has the potential to see in the in the player it, themselves and once you see yourself then you have the possibility of change it is like it's like the dancer coming to neutral before he does the next move you always come to first position and Absolutely. and and in in our in our evolution we have to come to first position we have to come to neutral so we can move on and um, so anyway I began to have a respect for acting so now as a director what I find so incredible is is to not just be able to do that within my own little character, but to be able to create this moving picture, to work with the actors to, to either verbally and intellectually share this idea that we've just shared, or never mind going there, but, but feed it in on some other level so that they are finding, finding a result that plays into my big picture. Bring up the aliveness to it. Yeah. And it's true that actors do have this incredible gift of being able to bring to the screen along with the, the, the other people that create it this great change of life that when you see a movie or you see a, um, a play that suddenly 
will hit home and, and it can change your life. It's a very important role that actors play and, right. and, and, the, and the encompassing talents. Yeah, and, it, and, it, and, it, and, and, and it, there are specific pieces in which you become aware that your life is changed by, but then the, the, also the, the strict entertainment, just, just the entertainment. Yeah, just how to escape. Healing, just how to escape. sit for two hours in a darkened theater with other human beings and yeah, exactly. And just have fun. That's whatever right. Whatever form you wish to, to take. That's right. Th we're running short of time, and I don't want to do this until we discuss what is the fascination, in your opinion, with the esoteric now in, in, in the entertainment industry, with the paranormal, mm. the incredible attraction and popularity of it? Well, I think, it, I, I think it's twofold. Uh, on one hand, I think that, uh, you know, it's sort of like you, you go around and you find out what doesn't work, you know, and I, I think as a... As, the body of man, you know, we fig I guess we figured out in the 80s that money's not the answer or power because it didn't work, did it? <laughs> you know, I, and, uh, you know, we've, we've sort of, there's been a lot of uh, exploration in the last century going outward into the material world and we're going to fix everything by building a bridge or everything's going to be okay because we're going to do this, right? But everything's not okay. No, the chicken in every pot isn't there anymore. That's right. So, and, and everything is not okay on a human level, just in the humanity of the moment. We do, we do not treat each other with humanity. We don't take care of each other. And um, so, so, Wait, excuse me. Uh, oh. <laughs> so, um, so there must be something else and it must have to do with our inner life. And so, again, we begin to look at what are those forces, try to explain and explore those forces that we can't explain, <laughs> you know? And I think that, that from X-Files to Poltergeist to Outer Limits to, um, you know, Star Trek in a certain sense, this, this exploration is really just um, a manifestation of, of what everybody's trying to do, is trying to figure it out, trying to, and, and what's great about it is, on this kind of broad canvas, because I, I believe within each of us are all the archetypes, right? I have King Lear in me, I have Oedipus in me, I have Juliet, I have Lady Macbeth, you know, and so do you. We all have that. They're archetypes because they're aspects of ourselves. But in this kind of uh, uh, canvas, you can, you can project those archetypes into other characters and then watch the struggle out there on this big melodramatic, you know, brooding, sensual, thunder-banging, you know, fascinating story, and and it's out there because that's what we're all looking for: is that the balance between the dark and the light inside of ourselves. And um, I mean, that's just my opinion. It's who knows. No, it I is mean, true. But, we but are, we are always that, looking for that: the balance of dark and light, because we all have our private thoughts. That, oh my God, how could I think that? And then we all have these wonderful blessed thoughts. You know, we go, wow. You know, it's and, really and, like. And is there anything wrong with dark thoughts? No, I don't know. You know, dark actions, on the other hand, you know, have consequences. But thoughts. Thoughts, I think we need to just accept ourselves. A we need more. to understand why we're having those thoughts rather than uh, blame ourselves and become, you know, uh, self damning. Exactly. You know, because I figure it's, it's like those who project human qualities on God, a, a punishing God. Well, what a human quality that is, a judgmental God. My goodness, aren't we silly? Yeah. You know, I mean, uh, though, to the me, Santa again, Claus I, God, if you're naughty, you're nice. <laughs> right, I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, human face, and, uh, and isn't it much more. Again, to me, it's much more ego where that we pun you know, we, the ego may have uh, think that it's usurped God's power or something and therefore projects its image on God and, and it sits around waiting to, to be punished and so be, because it doesn't want to be punished, it punishes you instead and you know, and then you're sick and dying suddenly with some chronic... Uh, Self-manifested punishing disease. Yeah. You 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 you're, you you are such a fascinating person to talk to, okay. multifaceted. I love the mod. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> mod is my company. Yes, mother, actress, wife, director. <laughs> you see, and that that's very inspirational for women to know that we can expand ourselves into other horizons in life and and be successful on on, on not the mundane. Uh, aspect of successful but successful fulfilled yeah. in our heart and I see that in your face and in your eyes and are you going to write we have one minute left are you going to be writing because I think you could write 
very spectacularly. <laughs> well, thank you. I, I, I uh, every now and then burp up a poem, sort of fully formed, and then, uh, and one of these days, yes, I think I'll it would be wonderful for you to write a child's book on your journeys when you were a child and those ima the Gulliver things that you did. Yes, would have been will be just exquisite. So yeah. perhaps you could think of writing that. That would be neat. I, I also have the greatest teacher now. I have a son who just turned eight, who is truly a wonderful teacher. He said to me the other day, he said, "You know, Mama, I'm thinking." And I said, "What's that?" He said. Well, I'm thinking God must have like a million faces. And I said, really, why is that? He said, well, because everyone sees him differently. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so I have a little genius. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for coming and sharing your life with us. And thank you for watching Contact. I'm Nina Rhodes. And thank you, Andersons, for providing this lovely setting. And until the next time, please take care. <laughs>